so today, uh, I'm, I'm not going to really quite preach a sermon today for the first uh, for the first part. Um, I talked to Josh earlier uh, in the week, and uh, and I, I, I we, we talked about maybe having like a little bit of a training for soul winning, questions and answers, you know, uh, things that you guys experience out in the, in the field, maybe how to you know overcome objections, how to approach certain scenarios, maybe problems with, you know, people that you know that you want to witness to, or uh, other religions that you're trying, you know, your other people that, you're, that are of other religions that you're trying to talk to, and whatnot, right? And the other thing that I want to address is, I know we, yeah, as a church, I've heard Josh address it many times from the pulpit about missions, like just getting out there, and I just want to share a couple stories about some of the some of the people that I've met along the way, and and the the influence that I've, I've been able to have on their life. Um, the other part of it is, is I know that we go soul winning, and um, one of the important things uh, that that I learned a long time ago, and which I try to do, is that you know to win the soul is one part, and that's very important. If you're if you're going to win a soul, or do nothing, win the soul, right? So that that's very important. But the other part of that is to actually try and disciple people actually get them and and do some work with them right and it's not one of my strong points I'll admit but I still do try to to witness to people so when we get them um, you know we get to the door we get them saved uh, even if we don't get them saved if you feel that maybe you planted a good seed right what I try to do is I try to leave some kind of contact with them for myself or the church for me personally I leave my personal contact number so anybody that's ever been soul winning with me, I don't think any of you have been soul winning with me, but anybody that's ever been soul winning with me will know that I always leave my business card. And I give them my, you know, I'm not recommending you do this, I'm just saying that this is what I do, right? I give them my cell phone number and I tell them, my phone's on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you ever need to talk, please call, right? Um, and, I, and a lot of people like that, just, just to know that somebody's out there that, that cares. I also try to get their, uh, when, I, when the people get saved, I try to get their address, and I always ask them if they have a Bible, and I always tell them I'll send them a Bible, right? And it's not so, it, obviously you want to get a Bible in their hand to teach them, but the, the purpose, the, the goal behind that is to keep an open line of communication. If I was to get them a Bible, send them some, some CDs, and they reach back out to me, then I can stay and communicate with them over time, and hopefully either get them into church, whether it be this church or another church, get them into church, or at least kind of guide them some way. Because uh, if you go out and you talk to people in the movement, you'll find that a lot of people in the movement, they got saved, but then they um, there was a few years, there was a, there was a gap in between them getting saved and them getting into church, right? And usually when you find, about, find out about that gap, it's the, the gap is, is somebody got them saved, but there was no follow-up. There was no kind of discipleship or, or anything. So that person kind of just kind of floated through the world on their own. And then one day they're like, hey, wait a minute. Maybe I need to go to church, right? I can think of a couple people where it took five, six, seven years, right? I think even um, uh, Pastor Mejia even said, I think it was a few years before, after he got saved. I'm not sure. There was one of, one of the pastors that said that. I might be misquoting it. But there's, you know, it's just it just took some time. So I like to get their, 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 their name and their address. I usually like to say to them, uh, I like to pray for the people that I get saved. If you're comfortable giving me your name and number, you know, and I, you know, I'd, be, you know, I'd be glad to keep in contact, pray for you, and I'll also send your Bible in the mail. So it's just something, um, it's something, it's good practice for here because we can try to get them into the church, but it's also good practice for when you go out into the mission field so that you actually can see the influence that you've had on these people in the mission field, right? Now I've had... Um, couple stories that uh, I was standing in a Walmart actually this was in Hamilton so this is a little closer to home and I was standing in Hamilton and uh, I just felt the need to go soul winning and I was in I was in the Walmart and I'm kind of a little crazy where I'll just walk in Walmart and just look for people that are kind of just kind of just wandering around and uh, I was walking around I didn't find anybody so I walked up to the front of the Walmart and I got my Bible in my hand and I'm like okay I guess that was a bust, right? And then this guy just walks up beside me, and he's like, how are you? And I'm like, hey, how you doing? And so we struck up a conversation, and uh, he goes, I'm blessed. And I'm like, oh, why are you blessed? He goes, because I'm out on a day pass. I'm like, what do you mean you're out on a day pass? And he goes, 
well, I have cancer. He goes, I'm dying. And he goes, I'm a, they let me out of the hospital today for a day pass. And I said, oh, okay, well, um, I said, well, since you're on a day pass and you've got cancer, you know, you know, you're going to heaven when you die. And he's like, I don't know. So it turns out that we were standing in front of Walmart. He was kind of weak. He couldn't stand there. So we walked back to my van, and he sat on the, on the, the bumper of the van. And he was a little confused, I think, because of the medication. So I was giving him the scriptures and stuff. And uh, I remember asking him again, so do you know if you're going to heaven? About halfway through it, do you know where you're going? He goes, I don't know. And he started crying. He goes, I don't know, I don't know. And, uh, and then I just pursued. I kept pursuing with it to the end. And uh, he got it, and he got saved, right? So I got his phone number, and I followed up with him, and uh, uh, I tried to follow up with him. He actually, um, I got his brother's number. I couldn't figure out how to keep in contact with him because he was in the hospital. And I was actually going away somewhere. I went away on a missions trip somewhere. And then when I come back, life gets busy and whatnot. And I kept kind of in the back of my mind, I got a call, I got a call, I got a call. And I couldn't. For some reason, I couldn't find his number, but I found his brother's number because his brother was with him when, when this all happened. And so I called his brother in, in out east somewhere, and I spoke to him, and he told me that the, his brother had passed, right? And he said, but even though he passed, he said even on his deathbed, he talked about the guy that he met at Walmart, and that he was so thankful that he knew he was going to heaven, right? So that's kind of the impact. So if you get these numbers, you get these kind of stories where... Where, you know, even though I didn't really disciple him, you, you can see the outcome of what you were able to do for him, right? Another lady, um, I was in Orlando, Florida, and I was just walking to my car. And, of course, I always have my Bible. Anybody that knows me, I always say, if you're going out, I have a Bible on you, right? So I had my Bible on me, and um, I was just walking, and a lady came up to me and asked me for $5. Actually, I, asked, I was with my friend, and she asked him for $5. So he pulls out $5, and he goes, before I give you this $5, I've got to ask you a question, right? So he asked her if she knew she was going to heaven, and she didn't know she was going to heaven. And he goes, well, I'm going to turn you on to my friend, because he was kind of more of a silent partner type, right? So I ended up giving her the gospel. We got to the prayer, and when we got to the prayer, um, she started crying. And it's not unusual to start crying, but she started crying. And uh, after the prayer... I'm like, okay, believe that? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, what's the matter? And she said that uh, she she borrowed the $5 because she was taking the bus somewhere because she was going to kill herself. She was on her way to go commit suicide. And we stopped her by giving her the $5. Now, most people would have just handed her the $5 and just said, you know, way you go. And she would have, I don't know what she was going to do with herself, but she was going to kill herself. And that woman, even up to a few months ago, I was still in contact with her. It's been a few years now. So every now and then I reach out, how you doing? You know, you're going to church, thank you for the Bible, right? So, uh, you know, I've been able to do that. Um, Brother Rob, I'm sure you guys know that, him and I were driving back somewhere, and we just stopped at a gas station in the middle of the night in some United States, I don't know, <laughs> somewhere, right? And uh, we ended up witnessing to everybody in the gas station. And it turns out the one guy that was there, um, I thought he was an employee, but he was a customer. So he, he was like, I thought he was stalking Pop. He was actually buying Pop, right? I ended up talking to him, and uh, he uh, he was um, went to church, and the pastor told me he was no good. So he wasn't that he would never. He was just no good. So he thought he could not be saved, and he thought that he could just uh, he was just going to go off and live his life, and he just didn't want to go to church. He thought he was going to hell, and uh, he enlisted in the military. He was going to he was going to Iraq to fight war, right? And uh, so I ended up giving him the gospel, and he got saved. So he uh, I sent him a Bible, and I stayed in contact with him a little bit until he got deployed. And he was taking the gospel over to Iraq with him to share with people, right? So again, just another another story about you know just getting out there and sharing with people, right? Um, and I th I think one of the one of the best stories that I have to tell. Actually, I tell I got two more stories. Um, I was down in Atlanta, and um, I was I was there for a, a conference, and but it was not with like a, a, a one of our conferences. It was another like a more of like a non-denominational conference I was down with, and uh, I went down with a pastor friend of mine, and we were there, and 
you know, I'm always walking around with my Bible. And for, Atlanta is usually pretty receptive for for people getting saved, in my experience there. But this time, this trip, people weren't as receptive as as I'm used to. Not compared to Canada, but they weren't as receptive. So I was like driving in my car, and I'm like, Lord, just you know, just lead me to somebody. I'm like, leave me tomorrow, you know, I'm like lead me to somebody. And uh, I pull up to my hotel room, and there's two guys standing. So this, the hotel was one of those ones where they didn't have the interior halls; they had the exterior walkways, and the rooms were, you know, they had like a railing, a walkway, and the rooms were here, right? So there's two guys standing in the front step. And I grabbed my Bible and I looked at them, and I'm like, okay, let's see how I can approach the conversation with this with these guys. So as I walked up, I uh, walked up to them, and they're like. Good afternoon, sir. Even though they, they look like thugs, they, you know, they got pants down to here, right? And, you know, the baseball cap over there, right? And, you know, they're about the, you know, they're about the age of my son at the time, you know, late teens, early 20s, right? How you doing, sir? Which is kind of unusual for, for you know, thugs to be saying, sir, right? I'm like, I'm blessed. And he goes, blessed? He goes, you're not from around here, are you? And I'm like, no, I'm not. And he goes, he goes I never heard blessed before. And I go, well, let me ask you something. I said, you know, if you died right now, do you know you guys are going to heaven? And they're like, no, we don't know. I'm like, well, you got a minute. And he goes, well, we were off to do something. I'm like, well, you got a minute. I'll take a couple minutes. Can I witness to you guys? You know, can I show you? And they're like, yeah, okay, okay, right? So, um, so the stairs go down like this, and the walkways are like this, and the, the, the building's behind me, my back. And there's, as I'm standing, they're standing on the steps, and they want to go. Right? But they're still standing on the steps and I'm kind of like me standing on the pulpit like preaching to them, right? So I started preaching to them and all of a sudden the skies opened up. Like like rain. And it wasn't just like a little bit of rain. It was like torrential downpour. But it wasn't like rain I've ever seen before. It wasn't rain that just came down and trickled down like, like would fall on your head. It was rain that blew like sideways. So it was like hitting them in the back. It was kind of like pushing us back, right? So we moved back, back, back. We got our backs up against the wall. They're standing beside me. And I'm like, there's a canopy like just from here to that wall over there. I'm like, let's just go over there, right? And they're like, yeah, let's just go over there. So I'm still witnessing. I'm still giving them scripture, right? So as we're walking, I'm walking behind him. And the one guy, you know, he's kind of got the lip, right? And he walks over and he goes, dude, this is weird. And the other guy goes, yeah, I know, right? And I, me and my... My, you know, my humble, not so humble state, like, yeah, I'm good, right? <laughs> so we walk over, we get underneath the canopy, and I end up witnessing to these guys. And I said, uh, okay, so, you know, what must I do to be saved after everything, you know? I like to qualify people, I'll cover that in a few minutes, but I like to qualify people before I get them saved, right? To make sure that they got what I just gave them, right? So I said, what must I do to be saved? And they're like, we gotta, we gotta believe. I'm like, so, you know, you wanna get saved? The one that, that there was the, the taller guy that asked me the question, and he's like, "No," nah. he goes, "I'm not good enough." He goes, "I was about to do something really bad." He goes, "I don't think God will let me into heaven." I'm like, "Well, what did I just say? You got to believe, right?" And he's like, "Yeah." I'm like, "Do you think you can let me into heaven with what I was gonna do?" I'm like, "If you get saved, you, you, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. It's like you got to believe, right?" And so it's, you know, you can't be good, can't be bad. You just got to believe. So like, all right, all right. So so they both bowed their head. They both prayed. So the taller guy, the guy that asked the question, um, he's talking, we end up talking, I'm like, now I'm like, you know, I'd like to pray for my people, can you give me, you know, the, that's what I said, give me your name, address, I'll send you Bibles and whatnot. And the other guy says to me, he goes, I gotta go, wherever they're going, I gotta go. So he's, he goes, he goes, I'll be right back. So he goes and he takes off, jumps in his car, I don't know where he goes. So I'm talking to this guy now, and he says to me, he goes, uh, he goes, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. And I'm like, what? He goes, because I was about to do something really, really bad. And, uh, and he goes, and he goes, and I was talking to my friend before you showed up. And my friend said to me, he goes, don't do what you're about to do. And he goes, I'm going to pray that you don't do it. And he goes, and I hung up the phone. And he goes, and you come walking up the stairs. <laughs> so his friend prayed that his, he, this guy wouldn't do what he was about to do, right? So I'm like, man, we got to thank your friend. He goes, well, no, you got to talk to my friend because he does. He's not saved. I don't think he's saved. And I'm like, well, where? Did, I'm in Atlanta. This is now. I got to paint the picture. It's nighttime. It's about two o'clock in the morning. I'm by myself, and I'm staying in a hotel by myself. I'm not staying with the group because I booked a hotel separate. 
So I'm by myself in Atlanta with a rental car and I'm talking to two thugs, right? And, and I'm like, well, where is he? And I don't recommend this, but I'm like, where is he? And he goes, he lives about an hour from here. I'm like, well, let's go see him. Because I'm leaving in the morning, I'm leaving in a few hours. And he goes, you get in your car and go see him? I'm like, absolutely, I go see him, right? And he's like, all right, let me call him. He goes, you'd actually get in your car? I'm like, yeah, I get in my car and go say, if he can be saved, I'll go. And he's like, okay. So we call up the guy and we get the guy on FaceTime, right? You know what FaceTime is, right? It's like um, where you can see the person on your cell phone. It's like camera phone, right? So, so the guy is laying on his bed. He's got no shirt on and he's kind of like laying like this on his bed. He's like, hey, and he goes, bro, you're not gonna mind. You're not, no, you don't know what just happened. He goes, what? He goes, remember how you said you were gonna pray? He's like, yeah. He goes, this guy showed up and he just got me saved. He goes, you, you, gotta, you gotta hear this story. And he goes, he wants to talk to you, he wants to come over. And he goes, ah, I don't feel like it. He goes, I don't want him to come over. I'm kind of in my bed, right? He goes, and I, and I grabbed the phone, I'm like, dude, like, I'll come over. I'm like, you want some pizza or something? I'll bring you a pizza, like, like, let me come over. I'm like, I'm leaving in the morning. And he's like, nah, man, he goes, I don't want to do this, man. He's, you know, he's like, look, no shirt. I was like, ah, no, nah, man, I don't want to do this, right? And this is the same guy that prayed, right? But anyways, he goes to God answers his prayers, right? And I said, well, how about we just do it on the phone? And he goes, yeah, okay, let's do it on the phone. So now, by now, we're still outside. It's still pouring rain. I'm like, let's go back to my room, and we'll do it from inside the room, right? So we go back, uh, we walk over to my room, open the door, and I have the thugs inside my room, right? And I rip out the ironing board, and I put the phone on the ironing board, and I ask the guy the question, uh, you know, if he died, you're going to heaven? He goes, well, I don't believe in the Old Testament, and I'm not sure about the New Testament, but I don't know. I don't know if I believe in the Bible. So I'm like, okay, well, how about if we just pretend and I show you what the Bible says and you see what's going on. So I start giving the guy the gospel. And the more I give it to him, the more he starts getting interested. And about three quarters of the way through the presentation, his girlfriend starts calling him. And I think she called him 60 times while we were on the phone. She kept hitting deny. He's like, man, she won't leave me alone because he wants to hear now the, the word, right? And it's just Satan attacking, right? The blottomite, right? Just, just, just attacking, attacking, attacking. And he's like, deny, damn it, leave me alone, woman. Block because she thinks he's having an affair or something, right? So I end up uh, in the process of witnessing to him. The first guy that left in the car came back. But now he's got a girl with him, right? So they come into my room. So now I got two more thugs in my room, right? So they're sitting. So I'm sitting at, on, on the edge of my bed in the iron board witnessing to him. The guy, tall guy standing right behind me. I got two people sitting on the ledge there by on the of uh, the hotel room, and I'm witnessing to this guy. And this phone just keeps going off from this woman, right? And uh, so, anyways, we get through it. The two of them get up and they walk outside, right? And I finish witnessing to, to him, and he gets saved. And then they're like high five him and his buddy, are like, "Yeah, this is awesome! Thank you! Oh, this is so good! Well, yeah, woo, kumbaya!" Right? So then we hang up the phone with him, and then I turn to the tall guy, and I'm like, "Who's that girl that just came in here?" Right? And he goes, oh, that's my friend's girlfriend or something. I'm like, well, what do you think Think she needs to know? And he's like, yeah, let's go. So we walk out the door, and they're, they're walking down the, the, the aisle. And he's like, hey, come back here. So they come back, and they're like, he said to the girl, you need to talk to this guy. So I'm like, hey, man, if you died right now, you know you're going to heaven? And she's like, I don't know. I'm like, do you want to know? And they're like, yeah, you got to know, you got to know, you got to know. She's like, okay, I'll know. So I'm like, well, come into my room, and let's, let's do this in the room, right? So you got to picture this now. So I'm facing her here and the door is behind me. So she comes over and she goes through the door here. I walk to the door behind her. Tall guy's behind me and the guy that took off is over there with him. Okay? And so as I'm walking behind her, I turn to him to say, come with me because I don't want to be in a room alone with this woman that I don't know. So I turn to come with me. And as I turn to come with the tall guy, he pulls out a gun and he says, here, hold this. And he gave it to the guy and the guy put it in his pocket and walked away. So I had a guy with a gun with me the whole time. And so I witnessed to the girl, she gets saved. And then I talked to him like, dude, what were you about to do? So in no short of terms, he, he was going to kill somebody. That's what he was going to do. He didn't tell me those exact words, but he was going to kill somebody. So I stopped it just because I went soul winning. Yeah. And I had no idea. All I said, God, just leave me to somebody. 
right? And I got four people in that moment, right? And it's not that I'm anything special. I'm just telling you that that if you have the heart and you go out, Canada's tough. It really, really, really is tough. But if you get out of this area and you go out into the world, these are the things that you experience. Like the woman that was committing suicide was in Orlando. These guys, these thugs, were in were in Atlanta, right? I had the the one guy in Hamilton, but that's that's one off. And now this is probably the best story that if you thought that was good, this is the best story that I have to tell. So we were at uh, we were in Arizona now, and we were at the uh, missions that missions uh, post trip conference. So I'm sure you guys have been to a conference, so you know what it's like. We all went out for dinner after, or no, we're in the middle of the conference. They had the dinner break, you know, they have dinner break. So we go for the dinner break. And we got, I think there's like 15 Baptists, you know, there's Bibles flying everywhere, verses flying across the table, right? Drinks, you know, water and pop, right? Not, not, in, not beer or anything like that, right? And we're telling stories and this, that, soul winning war stories. And, and it was kind of like, um, I, I've noticed that in the movement, we've, we've kind of progressed to, the, to what I would call kind of like the next generation. There was a generation of the, the soul winning marathons that Pastor Anderson did. And there was a core group of us that kind of hung out and just, we were always there. And now it's expanded beyond that, which, praise God, it's good, right? But that was kind of like one of the last times that the, kind of those core guys were kind of together in one spot. Like you see one here, one there, but all of us were together. So, you know, we're throwing, you know, Bible verses and stuff. And then the waitress comes up to me, not to me, comes up to the table, and she goes, can I just ask you guys a question? <laughs> and we're like, sure, what? And they're like, are you guys Christian? We got like, let no man deceive you, and you know, uh, we are the chosen, hear no evil, see, we got all these, Paul, everybody's wearing a Paul Whitberger shirt, right? And she goes, are you guys Christians? <laughs> and we're kind of like, uh, yeah. So we're like, yeah, we are. And then everybody's kind of, all the eyes are meeting on the table, like, okay, who's going to ask her, right? And like, everybody's kind of looking, and they all kind of looked at me, and I'm like, all right, fine. I'm like, let me ask you a question, right? You know, if, you know, if you die right now, you know you're going to heaven. She's like, no, I don't know. And she goes, actually, I'm looking for a church. And I said, okay, well, can I tell you? She goes, well, I'm at work. And I'm like, okay, well, how, you know, how long are you at work for? I'm like, I'm here all night. Like, I can come back when you're done. And she goes, I get off in like half an hour. And I'm like, well, I'll wait with you. Half, I'll, I'll wait for you half an hour. And she goes, okay. She goes, but I don't want to do it here in the restaurant because I you know I don't want to, this is where I work. And I'm like, okay, no problem. I'm like, we were kind of in like a patio kind of area. So there's all kinds of patios and restaurants. So it's kind of whatever, right? So I said, yeah, we just go sit on one of these other patios or we'll go sit, you know, on a bench somewhere and I'll witness to you. And she's like, yeah, okay. So at that time, Sister Sabrina was with me, right? Like, we were all a group, but she was with us, right? So when everybody got up to leave, I'm like, Sabrina, can you hang back with me? Because I don't know this woman and I don't want to be alone with this woman just in case, right? I just have a woman here, right? And she's like, yeah, okay, sure, I'll stay with you. And she was relatively new to soul wedding at the time, right? Actually, she might have been, like, real fresh to soul wedding, right? Not very experienced. So, so Sabrina and I kind of sat back in the restaurant. We're just kind of waiting, you know, just, okay. Half hour, 45 minutes, hour. And, we're, I, and I, 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 I didn't tell you the one detail is I was working at the conference. I was working the booth for Paul Wittenberger at the conference. So I can't afford to be past my lunch break because I'm working the booth, right? So an hour later, I'm like, where is she, right? I'm, I'm like, I said Sabrina, I'm like, I hope she didn't like just stand us up. And Sabrina's like, I don't know. And sh sh as soon as I said that, I get a little tap on the shoulder, and I turn around, there she is. And I'm like, okay. She's like, sorry, I got held up in the back of the work. I'm like, okay. So we take her out of the restaurant, and we go to this little patio that was for some pizza shop, and we sit there at the table. And she sat across from me, so I sat here, she sat there, Sabrina sat there. And I said, so so let me ask you something. I said, if you die right now, you're sure you're going to have it. And she says, no, I'm not going to heaven. She starts crying. I'm like, well, why aren't you going to heaven? She goes, because I've done some really bad things. And I'm like, well, the Bible says, you know, if you do bad things, you'll be forgiven, but you can still be saved, you know, you, you know. And she says, well, I don't think what I've done, God will, God will forgive me. And I'm like, yes, he will. I'm like, so then she starts to tell me her story. <clears throat> so she married a rich guy, and... Um, she went out somewhere, somewhere for a weekend or something, and she came home. She had a couple of kids with him. They had a really nice house, cars, the whole, the whole nine yards. And she came home and found her husband smoking crack with his buddy. So she freaked out, you know, yelled and screamed a little bit, but you know, he calmed her down and said, "Hey, you got to try this crack. It's really cool." So 
they both ended up becoming crack addicts. And because he was rich, when his family found out Children's Aid got involved, they took him and the kids and they excommunicated her because she had no money. So she lost the house, the cars, the kids, the everything, and she went from like being a well-to-do lady to living on the streets. While she was living on the streets, she befriended a guy. She's telling me the story, okay? But I'm just expecting just, you know, 15, 20 minute soul presentation and souling presentation back back to the show, right? <laughs> and uh, and she's telling me the story and she's bawling her eyes out. And uh, so she's like, yeah, so then I went, I was living on the streets. And then, um, and then what happened? Then she befriended some guy and he used to bring her stuff and, you know, just kind of take care of her. And then he said he had something, some job or some place for her to go look at. I can't remember the exact detail, but he wanted to take her somewhere. So he picked her up, took her somewhere, and he took her to some place and, she got, and it was gang rape. So she got gang raped, and then while she got gang raped, she got AIDS, HIV. And she goes, and it's all because I smoke crack and God will never forgive me. So how do you deal with that? <laughs> you went from just a plain soul winning marathon presentation to now you've got to you've got to take this book and you've got to show her the love of God. You've got to show her that God's forgiving. You got to show her the plan of salvation. You got to show her healing. You got to, you, got, you got to give her more. It's not just just you know a, a through Z like you know one two three repeat after me. Everybody says right. So I went through the whole plan. You know, gave her everything. You know, healed her heart a little bit, and she got saved. And then I said, well, do you have a phone number? Do you have a way I can contact you? And she's like, um, I'll give you an address to my grandparents. I said, because I want to send you a Bible. I want to stay in communication with you. I'm here for you. Here's my car. Call me anytime, day, night, you know, you know, you know the gambit, right? And she's like, okay. And she gave me a cell phone number that basically didn't work a day later, probably pay as you go or something, right? And I reached out to her a couple times over the next week or so and nothing. So I got home. I packed up a Bible, put some CDs in it, and I put uh, my contact number in my, my um, sometimes I write my number in the Bible, and I put my business card in the, in the Bible, uh, in the package, and I sent it off. So the conference will be, it's two years ago this month, that conference, right? This August, Josh and I are sitting in, and I haven't heard from her. So Josh and I are sitting in the airport waiting to go to Guyana in Toronto. And I get a text message come across my phone. Hey Shane, is this you? And I'm like, it is, who's this? And she goes, it's Juliet, do you remember me? And I'm like, Juliet from Arizona? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, how are you? And she goes, I'm great. She goes, I just got your Bible. And she goes, I got your contact number. And she goes, I just want you to know, she goes that after that night that you witnessed to me, she goes, my whole life changed. She goes, I turned my life around. She goes, I'm working, I've got my house, I've got my kids back. And she goes, I owe it all that you had took the time to, to witness to me. And and I was like, thank you. She goes, I'm getting I'm in a church, I'm getting baptized, and I just want to say thank you. And I go, You still in Arizona? She's like, Yeah, I'm like, Well, I'm coming to Arizona in January. And she goes, When you come to Arizona, she goes, she goes, you come stay with me. You and I said, Sabrina says hi. She goes, you and Sabrina come stay with me. I think she thought Sabrina and I were a couple, but right. And I'm like, well, I'll come visit, right? But she goes, I really want to see you. I'm like, I want to see you too. Praise God, right? So that goes to show you the power of what we do, and that's what we don't get when we don't get those phone numbers and we don't try to reach out to these people. Because I would have never known that. I just thought I got her saved, and away she went. But the impact that that moment that that few minutes that we spent with her impacted her life that two years later she, she just got her Bible there was no number no way to contact so she reached out to tell me that her life changed right so it's, it's very very powerful like don't ever underestimate when you get days like yesterday where people are laughing at you and, and calling you names and making fun of you and kicking you off their door and stuff like that just remember that that you get stories like this if you just go out there, right? And that one story, forget the other stories. One of those stories omits every other piece of adversity I've ever faced before in my life when it comes to soul winning. I've been in streets. I've been to Toronto. I've had the bottomites. I've had the people tick me off their porch. I've had the people want to fight me. I've had the woman come out and curse me. 
on the street and follow me and you know it's it's worth it right so never get discouraged you're in the toughest place in the world I, I believe that this church if we if we can build a strong soul winning church and we can get out into the mission field which obviously is outside these doors but if we can really get out into the further mission field and you guys actually see what it's like to go to places like Guyana where you just can't witness enough or go down into places into the states or go to Africa or go to these other countries where it's just the field is ripe unto harvest and you don't have to do much other than know the gospel you'll come back here with a new faith like a new zeal for soul winning because it's like nothing you've ever seen before and and I can't stress that enough for this church. I wish there was more people here that could hear this because I believe that this church, these seats would be full if people could understand that it's not so hard. Because we've got people, we've got soul winners in Toronto. We've got lots of soul winners in Toronto. But the majority of the soul winners in Toronto don't leave Toronto or they don't leave this area. And they think that this area is like everywhere. So they're like, well, why would I pack up my life and spend my money to get down somewhere to go soul winning if I can I'm just gonna get the same stuff here, same results here. I might as well just stay here. It's not like that. It's not like that here, right? So that's enough of me talking, which I've talked for quite a bit. But do you guys have any questions on, you know, soul winning or you know, witnessing to people? You know, objections, problems. Anybody you're trying to witness to that you're not sure how to get talk to them? Don't be bashful. You don't have any? Can't think of any? No. No? You? You? Anybody? Anybody? I've never, I've never, you've never done it? No. Well, you know what? You know what I did when I when when I first got saved. I, I don't know if you guys know this, but Brother Rob got me saved. And uh, yeah, yeah, Brother Rob was the one that got me saved. Be uh, five years in April. And he, uh, when I first got saved, I'm like, man, I need to tell everybody. I'm like, but I don't know what to say. He just said to me, he goes, until you get good at it, he goes, just bring them to me. And that's what I did. So if you know anybody that needs to get saved, that you want to get saved, right? If you don't know what to do, then bring them to somebody. Like, there's plenty of people here in the church that are willing to, you know, just reach out to somebody that you know. And for those of you that have people in your house that don't want to hear you, it's the, it's the same thing. Bring them to somebody else. There was a lady that uh, used to come here to, uh, I think she was at Trinity, and I don't know, Brenda, I don't know if you remember Brenda. Brenda, uh, you know, I talked to her from time to time, and she was trying to witness to her dad forever, and she never got through, she couldn't get through to him. You heard the story, right? Yeah, yeah, she couldn't get through to her dad. So she asked, so I said one day to her, I said, listen, I said, you know, tell me where he's at, I'll go see him. And she said, he's in the hospital in Toronto or Scarborough, I don't know, somewhere in the Toronto area. And I'm like, okay, I'll go see him. So I drove down to Toronto and I just walked into his room and I said, hey, I've been praying for you. You've got, you know, our church has been praying for you and I know your name. And I said, I don't know what you look like, so I just want to put a face to the name. I was in the area, <laughs> kind of, right? And uh, I just want to pray for you. And he's like, oh yeah, come on in. So I prayed for him and then I said, hey. You know, if you died right now, if you're going to heaven, he's like, I don't know. So I gave him the gospel and he got saved. So it just took somebody else to come in there and do the work. Do you have a question? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, if you have a friend or a family member mm -hmm. that you've given the gospel to mm -hmm. more than once or twice mm -hmm. and they're still rejecting, mm -hmm. at what, what point do you just wash your hands? and say, I give up, there's no point in doing it anymore. Well, you kind of never give up, but you, you become more subtle in your approach. So instead of giving them the full gospel, right, you just give parts. So as they talk to you, um, the one thing that, I, that, that makes a great soul winner, in my opinion, is the, the ability to listen. A lot of us, when we go soul winning, we're so, we're so fast to get to the gospel, we're so fast to open the book, that we don't listen to what the person's saying on the other end. Because I believe, some pastors, some people might, not pastors, but some people might disagree with me, but I believe that when you talk to somebody, when you knock on the door, or you talk to your friend, your neighbor, whoever it is, right? When you talk to them, you start asking them questions about, about you know, if, you know, if you die, you're going to heaven, right? 
You know, that initial approach tells you what you need to know to show them in the Bible, right? If all else fails, you show them what you know, right? But there's sometimes you can tweak your presentation just slightly for that person. So as an example, that woman that was at the rich house in Louisiana, when she said she was Catholic, my approach to the Catholic, it's the same gospel, but I throw in an extra verse for the Catholics, right? Um, and, and so that person that you're, that you're trying to witness to, right, if you listen to what they're saying, I'm not saying that you don't listen to it, but I mean like listen with, with this in mind and figure, okay, I can take them there or I can share this part of it. I don't have to open the book, but I can share the scripture with them. If you listen to them, and then in just those moments, you just share that one scripture with them and then you let them go. And then the next time you see them, if it's a family member, right? Because you already give them the full gospel, so it's not like it's not like you know times against you now, right? You've given them the gospel, they've rejected it. Right. So you give them that one little scripture, you plant the seed, and then you let it go, and then you plant the seed and you let it go. And then the other thing that happens is is they watch your hello, mm -hmm. they watch your they. I, I'll give you an example. My daughter, I have four kids, and my last daughter refused the gospel, refused it, refused it, refused it, refused it, refused it. I gave it to her, Rob gave it to her, another close friend of mine gave it to her, over and over and over again. My son took her and played her once saved, always saved, countless times, reject, 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 reject. I don't want to hear it. But she watched my testimony. She watched me, these stories that I've shared with you. I'll tell, I tell everybody, I tell all my kids these stories, right? So I would tell her these stories, but I wouldn't give her the gospel. She already got the gospel. She already knows what it takes, right? Hey, Amanda, how are you? So I would give her the gospel, and I would share with her, but then I would pull back, right? And then I would say, man, I was in Africa, and you know, all these people saved, and there was this guy, and this girl, and this story, and that story, and then it would stop, right? So you just keep doing that, but guess what happened? I was at, um, at, at uh, I went to, before, I was at a kind of a Pentecostal kind of church, non-denominational. So they had a Super Bowl party. I know we're not, we don't think it's cool, but whatever. They had a Super Bowl party. But the goal of the Super Bowl party was for the community and invite the community in. And then at halftime, they cut the show off, because that's usually where the wickedness happens, right? Well, the whole thing's wicked, but that's usually where most of the wickedness happens. And they gave them a gospel presentation. So I gave the gospel presentation for the halftime show. That was the halftime show, right? Which was probably the best halftime show I ever had, because this was last February, right? And so, my daughter doesn't go to church, doesn't want to go to church, doesn't want to hear about church, doesn't want to hear about Jesus, don't talk about Jesus, but she'll listen to soul winning stories, right? She showed up to, to, to church. And I gave the, the, the gospel presentation, and unbeknownst to me, she got saved. I just found out last week that she got saved. My last daughter, remember I told you the other day that my last daughter, I've been praying every day, can you please, uh, God, please open my daughter's heart so that she can save me? Well, she's been, she got saved like, I don't know, eight months ago, <laughs> right? But she didn't want to tell me because she didn't want to let me know that she, she gave into what the whole family's been preaching, right? So that's what I'm saying is that that tough person, you're going to get them with your testimony. The, the fact that, um, like my daughter came with me before that same daughter in question. Like I have a business where I go into different stores and I count things, right? And I would go into the store and I would be, um, you know, doing my thing, you know, just counting whatever. But I've always got, I'm always got my mind on the gospel. I'm always thinking about, I'm listening to people for that opening. Because people will open the door if you just, just give them a little bit and you listen a little bit. Sometimes they'll open that door that you can just expose it and go right in, right? So, you know, the one guy in the store, he opened the door. I went in, gave him the gospel. And then I got to the end and I was trying to explain it to him, trying to explain it to him that last little part about the eternal security, and he just wasn't getting it. And my daughter was listening to me, and she, she's just like, hang on a second, let me tell you how it's done. She's not even saved. Let me tell you how it's done. It's like this, this, and this. And he got it, and then he got saved, right? But I didn't have to give her the gospel. She's sitting there listening to it, all the explanations that I have. But it's my testimony that, that got her. So you have people around you, the people that are rejecting you, that don't want to hear it, they're watching you. Even though you don't think they're watching you, they might think you might think that they think you're crazy, and maybe some of them do, but they're still thinking, what if there's some truth to that, right? And by going out and having that testimony, 
and going out and sharing the gospel and coming back and talking about it, even if they're in the room and you're talking to your son, right? And just saying, oh man, wasn't that great today? Remember that lady? And you're just telling the story. Or man, how was Guyana? You go to Guyana and you come back with all kinds of stories. I mean, obviously, you've heard some of them. And that unsaved person or your family member that's not there, they're going to ask you, how was Guyana? You're going to say, man, Guyana was amazing, right? The water was great, the food was awesome, but the soul winning was off the hook, right? And then you just start talking about, man, there was this guy, he got hit by a car, his face was crushed in, you know, his eyes falling out of his face. I give him the gospel, he's thanking me that he's not going to hell. You start telling them the stories like that, they're going to be like, I kind of want some of that, right? Because you don't need to keep giving them scripture after scripture after scripture. They don't want to hear the scripture. They've heard the scripture. So now they want to see the change in you because they want what because they're going to see your walk and your happiness and your zeal, and they're going to want what you they're going to want what you got. Right? So that's what that that's that's how you win the hard the hard luck cases. And maybe you'll never win them. But testimony goes a long way. I can fully finally attest to that. That that goes a long way. Thank you. Right? So we're doing it a little different today. I didn't, I didn't preach a sermon. I, was tell, I told some soul winning stories about just some of my greatest hits, I guess you could call it, right? And I opened the floor to questions about soul winning. The ins, the outs, problems, people that you want to witness to, just if you got anything, shoot. Yesterday was uh, pretty rough. Yeah, I heard. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, in speaking with a lot of Catholics, mm -hmm. um, I thought it might be good to say, oh, I used to be Catholic, so they can kind of see mm -hmm. that there's a difference. Mm -hmm. But I'm noticing overall it's not making much of, much of a difference, much of an impression. A lot of the Catholics were the ones who were slamming the doors and laughing at us when I said, I can show you in the Bible where it says that we can know. Mm -hmm. And just laughing and like slamming the door. So, um, you know, it's pretty rough in Canada. It, it's definitely rough in Canada. Yeah. And that's that's uh, that's kind of where, where, I, where I was telling the, the early crowd here that it's, Canada's tough, it's tough for me, right? And I'm like, a, I'm somebody, like I said, I'm nobody special, but just somebody who's been around the world and had the privilege of talking to thousands of people, probably. Canada's tough, and it's gonna it's gonna drive you to want to quit, right? I'm not saying that you will quit, but there's times that even myself, I'm like, what am I doing? You know, that door slams in your face, and you're like, Phew. you know, okay, fine, right? And you know, you know, you walk out. You, you you know, I had the one lady last year, last Canada Day. I knocked on the door. Her son answers the door. He's got no shirt on. His pants are like down to his knees. And he's like, "Yo, what's up, right?" And I'm like, "Hey, man, you know, we're inviting people to church. You know, if you died right now, you know, you're going to heaven." And you just kind of, and then he kind of laughed. And his mom's like, "What?" From the back, and she just come out cursing me. And um, she's like, she's like, "You blah 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 blah," and just swearing up a storm. And I'm like, "Thank you," because <laughs> you know we're supposed to say thank you, right? Thank you, thank you. And I'm walking to the next house. She's following me, like following to the next house. I'm walking up the thing. She's standing on the porch, and she's still cursing at me. I'm knocking on the next door, and she's still cursing at me. And then the neighbor comes out, and she's like, "What's going on?" And she's like, "That blah 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 blah." And she's just yelling. Now she's in the middle of the street. There's people coming out, and she's still cursing me. And I'm still soul winning. Hey, man, you know, we're by people in church and this woman's yelling at me, right? And, but I've never had that anywhere else. Right? Yeah. So it's tough. It, 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 it's tough. And I, and, and I don't think that as Canadians, um, you know, the, the people on the outside watching us, you know, I'm talking about like in other churches, other places, they don't understand what it's like to be here. Like maybe they have their own tough times too. And I'm not diminishing that. It's, it's tough everywhere, but... We got a hard time here, and it and it's you got to be you got to be on game and on point to really get through it, Ment yeah. mentally and spiritually. I think the thing that keeps us going is that we know that the Bible says that that yeah. we will encounter people like this all the right. time, right? Right. Most people don't want to hear. Now it's my understanding, and I, you know, and I, I'm pretty sure, but I, I'm not gonna say I'm 100 percent sure, so I might be corrected on this, but. My understanding is, is if you open your mouth and ask the person if they want to be saved, like, you know, you know, if you died, you're going to heaven. Like, if you ask them about the gospel, 
Whether you ask them or you get them saved, it's the same reward. I've heard that before. So think about it. That person that kicked you off their porch, get out of here, you bleep, 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 right? And slams the door on you because you ask them if they want to know about Jesus. God's eyes, it's the same reward as if you stood there for an hour and gave them the gospel. So what do you got to lose? You're still getting credit. You're getting the same credit. You might even, I don't know. I'm speculating now, I'm not saying you know that I know. Maybe you get more credit because you're actually facing the persecution that says if you face persecution, greater is your reward. Right? So maybe we should be like kind of like, yes, you know, slam that door. Yeah, right on. Right? I don't know. But don't get discouraged. I, I uh, can I retell this story, at least about the last story about Juliet? So I was talking about, I started off this kind of conversation about people that I've had the privilege of witnessing to, and I talked about discipling, right? About, we may not be able to disciple them, but getting them saved is, is not the be all end all, right? We, obviously we know we're trying to try to disciple them. So what I try to do with, with myself, and again, I said I don't recommend this to everybody, but I usually give up my phone number. I give a business card with my phone number, I said call me day, night, anytime, phone's on need to talk, don't worry about it, call me, right? But the other thing that I do, which you guys can do, is I always ask them if they have a Bible, one, and I said, if you were willing to give, and I said, I'd like to pray for the people that I get saved, if you're willing, if you give me your name and address, I'll send your Bible in the mail, right? So you can do that here, you can do that anywhere, you can do that, that that's just common practice for me, right? So the, 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 it's twofold, one, you got their contact info, so you can stay in contact with them, right? And for two, it opens up a line of communication that you never know when they're going to reach out, right? And and it, and, it, and you, you try a couple times. It's not like you keep going, man, this guy won't respond. Just, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, right? But you do get the uh, the odd time where people will call, will contact you back. And, you know, you've seen that you've done a difference. And you've made a difference, right? So here, here's what happened to me. Um, um, I've had some, I had a couple of stories, but I'm going to tell the, the, the last one. We were in Arizona t two years ago for the, did I tell you this story? The, no, I, no, I couldn't have told you the story. Or did I tell you the story? Maybe I did because you picked me up from the airport. I might have. The, the, the lady from uh, Arizona? The homeless lady? Does that ring a bell? I think so. No? Okay. Well, I'll tell her if you heard it, then I'll tell you the other story, right? Um, so two years ago we were in Arizona, and uh, we're at the, uh, the post-trip conference. So a whole bunch of us go for, for dinner, and you know we got Bibles everywhere. You know the Baptist got their Bibles, and everybody's wearing like we are the chosen. You know let no man deceive you, right? We, everybody's wearing a Paul Winberger shirt, right? There's Bible verses getting thrown across the table, and it's war stories, and it was kind of like uh, I said, like uh, there in the beginning a few years ago when I first got saved, it was kind of around the beginning of all the soul winning marathons that Pastor Anderson had, where he would go from town to town. And there was a kind of a core group that did that traveling. That's where you see that black T-shirt that we have, right? It was kind of that core group. And uh, those guys, since because it's grown so much, everybody's kind of spread out. So we don't kind of get together. It might, it might have been one of the last times all of us were kind of together in one spot. So we were uh, we were just uh, sitting there talking, you know, gabbing. And this waitress walks up to us. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Sit down. It's okay. So the waitress walks up to us, and she's like, you know, it's a full table of Baptists, and she's like, excuse me, but are you guys Christians? <laughs> and we're all kind of like, uh, yeah. And she's, she's like, well, I'm looking for a church. And then, of course, you know, everybody's eyes are kind of like, are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? Who's going to do it? Are you going to do it? Right? And everybody, all the eyes pointed at me, so I'm like, okay, I'll do it. But I said, hey, do you know if you died right now, if you know you're going to heaven? She's like, I don't know. I said, well, can I share with you? She goes, well, I'm working. I'm like, well, when do you get off? She goes, well, I get off in half an hour. I said, well, if I wait for you, will you, you know, will you be interested? She goes, you wait for me? I'm like, sure, I wait for you. And she's like, I don't know. It was a side note. I was working for Paul in the booth, so I couldn't really take the half an hour, but soul winning, right? So Paul's going to be okay with it. So so she's like, yeah, okay. I'll, she goes, but I don't want to do it here. I want to do it because uh, I work here. I'm like, okay, well, it's all kinds of patties. So tell this story or no? This no. no, okay. So there's all kinds of patios out in this area. So, oh yeah, we'll just go to another patio table and we'll just sit out there. So as everybody's getting up, Sabrina was at the table and I said to her, she was there at the conference, and I said, hey, can you sit behind 
with me because I don't know this lady and I don't want to go someplace with the lady and have any problems, just kind of hang back. So she's like, okay, I'll hang back. So she hung back. So her and I are sitting there waiting for this lady. Half hour goes by, 45 minutes goes by, an hour goes by, and I'm supposed to be back at Paul's booth, right, working at the booth. So I turn to Sabrina, and I'm like, I hope she didn't stand us up. And as soon as I said that, I go a tap on the shoulder, and it's the lady. I'm like, oh, okay, how are you? So her name is Juliet. So we take Juliet, we go to sit at this patio, it's like a pizza place, and we just sit outside on, on, on the table. And I said, so you know, you know if you die, you're going to heaven? She's like, no. She goes, I don't think I'm going to heaven. She goes, I've done too much wrong that I can't go. She starts crying. And I'm like, well, you know, you know, it doesn't really matter what you've done. You know, God will forgive you. You know, you can still be saved. And she's like, no, I don't think he'll save me because I've done too much wrong. And she's, she's really crying, right? And then I'm like, well, what could you possibly have done, right? Sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but it's kind of like, when you tell you the story, it's kind of like, whoa, right? And uh, I'm like, what could you have possibly done? And she started telling me, she goes, well, she goes, I married a guy who was rich. And we had lots of money, and uh, you know, we had houses. We had a house, we had cars, we had kids. And she goes, I went out one day, and I came home, and I found him smoking crack with his buddy. She goes, so I freaked out, yelled at him, screamed at him. He called me down. He says, you got to try this stuff. It's amazing. So she goes, so I tried it. And she goes, and him and I became addicted to it. And because he was rich, when the children's aide found out, tried to take the kids away. They took him and the kids and excommunicated her because said she was to blame for all this. So she ended up going from being well-to-do, living in a nice house and cars and family, to being on the streets. So she started living on the streets. And then she befriended a guy, and he used to bring her things and stuff, and he said he was going to help her out, he was going to find her a place or something like that. So she got in the car with him, and he took her to some place to get her help, and he took her to some place, and she got gang raped. And in the process of getting gang raped, she got HIV. So you can only imagine what we're experiencing on the other end, because I just thought it's going to be like quick 15 minute soul winnings, and the way I go, right? This one was bawling her eyes out. And so now you got to take the book, and not only now is it, uh, you know, the plan of salvation, you got to show the healing, you got to show all kinds of stuff. You got to, you got to, you got to use it now, right? You got to use the word to help this woman, right? So we got through it all. She got saved, and. As I said just now, you know, can I, can I get your phone number if you're comfortable? Can you give me your address? Do you have an address? Because I live on the street. And I, she goes, the only address I know is my is my, my grandparents. And I said, well, can I have a grandparents' number? Here's my car. Call me anytime, day, night, and uh, and uh, if you know, I'll send you a Bible in the mail to your grandparents. You know, and my contact info will be there. And she says, okay, thank you. So that was two years ago. I reached out to her a handful of times over the next week. The number was went dead, so it was probably pay as you go or a burger or something. And that was it. That was the end of Juliet for me. So got home, sent the Bible, and that was it. So Josh and I were sitting at the airport in, uh, to go to Guyana in August. And on my phone, I get a message saying, hey, Shane, is this you? And I'm like, yes, it is. Who's this? And she goes, it's Juliet. Do you remember me? And I'm like, yes, I do. Juliet from Arizona. And she's like, yes, it is. And she goes, I just got your Bible. And she goes, and she goes I just want to tell you that after that night that, that you witnessed to me, she goes, my life completely changed. She goes, I turned my life around. She goes, I got my house back. She goes, I got my kids back. I'm in church. I'm working. And I'm getting baptized this next month, September. And she goes, all I want to do is just reach out and say thank you because I just got your information. And I'm like, that's so awesome. I'm like, you still in Arizona? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, I'm coming to Arizona. And she's like, come stay with me when you come to Arizona. I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll come say hi, right? So um, hopefully hopefully I'll see her when we go in January. But there's light at the end of the story. And I told other stories of things like that from reaching out to people around the world and just things coming back to you that, uh, that it's worth it. Right? It's worth it. I'll tell another quick story. I was in Walmart in Hamilton. I'll give a Canadian story because we were talking about Canada, right? We were in, I was in Walmart, walking around with my Bible, looking to see who I could soul win with. <laughs> the devil's looking for who he could devour. I'm looking who I could save, right? <laughs> and I go through Walmart, and I come out, and I'm standing at the front door, and I'm like, okay, that was a bust. I got my Bible in my hand, and I'm now look, scoping the parking lot to see if there's any, you know, anybody. And this guy walks up to me, and he says, hi, how are you? I'm like, hey, how are you, right? <laughs> and we strike up a conversation, and I'm like, how are you doing today? 
And he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm awesome. I'm like, why? He goes, because I got a day pass. I'm like, day pass from what? He goes, I got terminal cancer. And he goes, they gave me a day pass to come out. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I said, so let me ask you a question. And I just went right into soul winning. He's like, I don't know. So I took him. So he could. It was too weak to stand. So him and his brother came to my van, and they sat on the edge of the van. And uh, I just whipped open the Bible, and I started talking to him. And he was having some a little a hard time understanding because he because uh, of the medications. But he was getting it. But it was just a little bit more, right? I'm like, so what is it taking? He's like, I don't know. And he just started crying, right? And I'm like, explain it to him. Explain it to him. He got it. He got saved. And I'm like, okay, as I always do. Can I have your number? And I'm going to reach out to you. I'm going to come and see you. But he didn't have a number because he was in hospital, so he gave me his brother's number. That's the part of the story. I forgot. I just remember it now, right? So I got his brother's number. His brother lives out east. So I was going away somewhere. I don't remember where I was going, but I was going on a big trip. I went on the trip. I came back. Life got busy. I forgot. About two months later, I reach out to the brother to see where the other brother is, you know. And I said, hey, man, uh, how's your brother? And he goes, he's passed, right? And I said, oh, okay. He says, but he goes, I want to thank you. He goes, because on his deathbed, he was still thanking the guy that came and talked to him that day at the Walmart. And he goes, I just want to thank you. And I'm like, no problem. It was my pleasure. So we know he's in heaven, right? So when you're out there and you're experiencing that turmoil, that those problems, the door slamming in your face, all that stuff, trust me, it's worth it because you get stories. I told four stories that you only got two, right? I have, you, you get stories like that. I have more, but I don't, we don't have time, right? But you get, you get stuff like that, and it makes it all worth it. Julia texting me for the last four years of all this nonsense I've been through, like I've had more, way more good than bad, but even the bad, I forgot all of it. When I seen Juliet, it's Juliet from Arizona. And you made a difference in my life. That one person. It really is worth it. So don't get discouraged. It's tough out here. 